Um, welcome everybody, uh, benvenuti, un caloroso benvenuto a tutti voi presenti stasera, soprattutto gli ospiti trentini, i partner del progetto che vedremo fra qualche momento. Dunque, uh, benvenuto uh, anche agli altri italiani presenti. Um, but I imagine that seeing we all in here in New York, we will continue um, in English for the time being, unless I'm distracted. Um, i am here by accident really i'm the director of the italian academy but um, and we extend a warm welcome on behalf of columbia and on behalf of this institute which has become increasingly interdisciplinary over the years and to some extent i'm very grateful to my dear friend and colleague Jeffrey Schnapp, who along with Elisabetta Terrani, I think masterminded uh, the project, although no doubt we will hear from Giuseppe Ferrandi la parte um, trentina anche in questo, nella concezione di questo progetto. But um, Jeffrey really was f uh, uh, basic to the recreation of the Italian Academy as an institute which opens its arms to people from all disciplines and all professions. I'm particularly happy to be able to welcome him back here this evening. Now I first met Jeffrey many years ago when we were both fellows at the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery in Washington, an extremely conservative institution. And, um, I could tell you many stories about that, but we must get on to the business of the, this evening. But when I met Jeffrey, he was working on the subject of vehicular crashes. In other words, incidenti stradali. And he concentrated especially on the p sad fate of Marinetti. We've heard enough about Marinetti in the last year. So let me go back to Jeffrey's interest in... Um, in vehicular crashes. That was a project, needless to say, which pretty much went nowhere. So I'm very mu happy tonight to <laughs> I'm very happy tonight to see him here with a project that clearly went somewhere and has gone somewhere and has in fact um, reutilized re those remarkable tunnels in the mountains beyond Trento um, and in a project which uh, paves new ways to um, urban redevelopment and the use of disused spaces. Hence, I suppose, although you will uh, improve me on this later on, hence, I suppose, the allusion also to the High Line. This is a fruitful use, the museological, expository, historical, commemorative use of um, disused spaces. So, but this I'm going to leave to the rest of you to discuss this evening. Um, in it, uh, Jeffrey briefed me on this introductory uh, session, and in a completely characteristic way, he managed, to avoid, um, he managed to avoid giving an account of the most boring aspects of your lives. In other words, our four panelists who I'm going to introduce uh, at uh, this even now are all professors, but somehow in these bios, their professorial side has been eliminated. And so I am going to tell you about the non-professorial side of our distinguished guests. So, of course, Elisabetta Terrani, who most of you know, is, although she is here and has this role which we will not speak more of at City College in New York, she's actually a major architect, very innovative architect. She's worked all over the Engadina and the Como area. You can see her in the fight and atlas of 21st century architecture. So we are very happy happy, uh, Elisabetta, that you are here to present the project along with Jeffrey. Then our um, distinguished panelists, I think I managed to put them in more or less um, alphabetical order. Kurt Forster I've known for a very, very long time. In fact, he will have forgotten, but I remember giving a lecture on, archit on ornament at the Victoria and Albert Museum when I was about 25 or something and Kurt Forster was in the audience and I was completely terrified and he never said anything to me for about 10 years after that. Um, but now we have become quite good friends so I think that um, I'm very happy to have him here this evening. As you know he has had a long and distinguished um, career uh, really uh, globally. Um, he's fetched up in Yale at the moment where the School of Architecture is flourishing more than ever before, largely because of his presence. Of course, I'm delighted that you are here this evening. 
And then proceeding on the usual academic assumption, I'm afraid that these, our panelists are so distinguished that we don't need to go into the details of their bibliographies and the various etapes on their, on their career. Um, then I also want to welcome Aaron Levy, who... Um, <coughs> Uh, in addition to those other responsibilities is the founding director of the Slot Foundation and actually uh, made a major contribution last year to the curating of the official US presentation at the Venice Biennale into the open. So I'm very happy that Philadelphia has managed to make it up to New York this afternoon. It wouldn't be possible tomorrow because aspettiamo di nuove le nevicate via Verto. Um, these are the perils of New York at these times. Um, then, I'm very happy, where is Stanislas? Uh, uh, there he is, I haven't seen him for a long time either. Welcome back Stanislas. And uh, he comes, from, of course, from Zurich. He was the inventor and the first, as he calls it, the inventor of the, and first editor of the magazine Architez. And, of course, you know him from his writings from Le Corbusier up to Rauch and Venturi. Venturi and Rauch, I suppose, is the way we say it these days. I'm happy to see you here. I don't think we've seen you here often enough, Stanislaus, so you must come back. Um, and then someone whom, fortunately, we do see often enough, um, because uh, Marco de Michelis is a visiting professor on my own faculty of art history so, and I have been away on sabbatical for some time so I'm very happy that Marco is here representing my own department and um, I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to hearing his comments, his critical comments no doubt on the tunnels project as you know he's editor of Ortagono, he's been curate, chief curator at the Triennale in Milan and is also director. There's a sort of Como um, connection here, I must say, because I see that in addition to Elisabetta and Kurt, there is also Marco, who is the director of the foundation, the Fondazione Ratti in um, Como. So, welcome to you panelists, but I must also welcome here um, Giuseppe Ferrandi, sono molto contento di averla qui stasera, eh, professore, e adesso lui è il direttore del Museo Storico a Trento da 2003, e anche dirige eh, il giornale Archivio Trentin, siamo lieto di averla qui stasera e adesso do la parola al professore Ferrandi. Professore. Signore e signori, eh, noi siamo ovviamente eh, onorati e ringraziamo eh, il direttore dell'Italian Academy, eh, i relatori e il, il pubblico. Eh, il progetto eh, di riutilizzo eh, delle due gallerie stradali di, di Trento eh, può essere presentato in vari modi e sicuramente... Eh, Jeffrey Snap e Elisabetta Terragni lo presenteranno in modo molto eh, preciso, appassionato e competente. Eh, io volevo eh, spendere poche parole per parlare del, del contesto in cui è nato questo progetto, della, del metodo e brevissimamente del contenuto. Ora, il contesto è il contesto eh, di, una, di gallerie costruite eh, all'inizio degli anni 70 per eh, far passare la statale del Brennero, che è una grande strada di comunicazione che collega l'Austria, la Germania con l'Italia. Nell'ottobre del 2007 eh, queste gallerie sono state sostituite con altre gallerie e dall'ottobre 2007 abbiamo iniziato a ragionare su come utilizzare questo grande spazio di 6.000 metri che tagliava e feriva il quartiere storico di Piedicastello, che è un piccolo quartiere di una città, lo dico per chi non la conosce, piccola, eh, non più di 100.000 abitanti, anche se è un, eh, una città piena di storia, piena di riferimenti eh, culturali, ma ripeto molto, molto, eh, molto piccola. Il 19 agosto del 2009, quindi l'anno dopo, abbiamo fatto la prima presentazione, inaugurazione, con una grande festa di popolo, 
invitando tutto il quartiere a riappropriarsi di questo spazio e il 5 dicembre 2010, pochi mesi fa, abbiamo inaugurato invece la, il percorso storicamente ABC che poi vi verrà eh, raccontato. E il metodo che ci ha ispirato è un metodo eh, conseguenza della sensibilità e della delicatezza del progetto di riutilizzo. Eh, il quartiere che era stato come dire, attraversato dalla, da queste due eh, grandi gallerie e da un grande intervento di impatto eh, che ha lacerato la, la, il tessuto urbano, il tessuto sociale, pensate che da una parte c'era la, la chiesa, la parrocchia del quartiere, dall'altra c'era la piazza e in mezzo queste due gallerie, quindi eh, una cosa davvero inimmaginabile per chi non le ha viste e per chi eh, non ha vissuto magari quel periodo eh, traumatico. Quindi dovevamo stare molto attenti a non forzare la mano, a non calare dall'alto il progetto e abbiamo fatto anche molta fatica per coinvolgere tutti gli attori sociali e istituzionali che agiscono in quel contesto. Dall'altra abbiamo ritenuto che solo con la partecipazione di tanti soggetti, di tante competenze, di tanti livelli, era possibile riuscire a fare nascere un progetto così. E, e quindi, oltre alla competenza scientifica, metodologica, architettonica, che è stata, come dire, eh, contattata, oltre all'apporto della, della Finwork, abbiamo lavorato col comitato di quartiere, con le associazioni civiche, con un comitato Santa Pollinare che ci ha eh, cucinato la polenta il giorno dell'inaugurazione. E c'era qualche salotto buono della città che diceva mm, non è una, un bel modo di iniziare un museo, però noi abbiamo mangiato la polenta e abbiamo bevuto buon vino. E qui il metodo quindi, eh, il contesto, il metodo figlio eh, del contesto e infine una parola sul contenuto. Eh, questo è uno spazio dedicato alla storia. La storia, il eh, tema della memoria, specialmente la storia e la memoria contemporanea, per una realtà come il Trentino è un elemento molto forte perché il Trentino è una terra di confine, è una terra dotata di autonomia concessa dalla Costituzione italiana, dalla Repubblica italiana, è una terra che è stata colpita duramente durante il primo conflitto mondiale, essendo fronte, terra di profughi, terra di movimento di eh, popolazioni, movimento coatto, durante la seconda guerra mondiale è stata anche lì al centro eh, del conflitto e, e sulla storia credo che il Trentino abbia costruito gran parte del proprio modello di convivenza e di autogoverno. Quindi è un tema delicato, un tema strategico. Quindi, eh, il Presidente della provincia, eh, Lorenzo Dell'Ai, che ha mandato anche qui, ovviamente per interposta persona, un saluto a voi tutti, ha deciso di affidare al nostro museo il compito di riempire un po' di contenuti questo progetto e noi ci siamo mossi pensando, e chiudo su questo, che eh, anche la storia locale, anche la storia regionale, che può sembri, sembrare eh, più povera, più semplice, più scontata, più eh, come dire, prigioniera anche del localismo, può essere anche una grande occasione per fare storia, perché fare storia è sempre complesso, eh, l'importante è farla con correttezza, con metodo, io direi anche con una certa passione civile che non guasta. Quindi storia locale e regionale per leggere eh, a partire da, dal territorio, da un territorio specifico, la scala e le varie dimensioni, anche la dimensione nazionale, europea, mondiale, e poi specialmente storia dal basso, termine un po' desueto, storia sociale, storia eh, 
delle comunità, non storia eh, come dire, diplomatica, non storia eh, istituzionale ottocentesca e questo ci ha permesso appunto di eh, utilizzare le memorie espressione delle comunità, noi abbiamo un archivio di 550 eh, video interviste che eh, non sono tante però non sono nemmeno poche, abbiamo un archivio della scrittura popolare che raccoglie i diari della, eh, dei combattenti della prima guerra mondiale, abbiamo questa, da tempo questa sensibilità per rappresentare appunto questa dimensione plurale eh, della storia e quindi le gallerie e il progetto che verrà poi illustrato eh, risponde anche a questi criteri metodologici ovviamente siamo all'inizio, le gallerie sono nate l'anno scorso e, e siamo venuti qui anche per sentire, per capire quali potrebbero essere gli sviluppi da dare a questo progetto grazie Um, first of all, thank you to everybody for being here this evening. Uh, we're, on behalf of all of us who have been involved in this project for the last uh, to really three years, uh, it's, uh, it gives us great satisfaction to be able to present this project to you as a work in progress, but a work that has made a great deal of progress since its inception. Um, a lot of the points that Beppe made for those who are non-Italian speakers in the group, uh, I will actually be touching upon in the presentation of the galleries, particularly those that have to do with the methodological presuppositions of this um, r really quite experimental project that involves, as the poster suggests, not only the recovery and reuse of an abandoned industrial site, but um, as Beppe Ferrandi, I think, importantly underlined, the healing of a, a, a social wound that was uh, created by one of those brave and, uh, and, and kind of mindless acts of urban renewal of the late 60s and early 70s, which literally split in half one of the historic working class districts of the city of Trento that lies right at the, foot, right at the footsteps, really at the entrance to the city itself. So really a, a quite emblematic act of, of, uh, of uh, disruption of a community that has now been restored through this project, which really fundamentally reshapes, of course, the, the usage of uh, these two tunnels and uh, a, a repurposing that also involves a, a rather ex experimental rethinking about what can be done with the sorts of archival materials in which a region like the Trentino is uh, particularly rich. But before starting in on the presentation proper, I wanted to, there, uh, the, the team uh, that made up this, this is a very large scale project as uh, Beppe Ferrandi mentioned, it, the uh, total square footage or the, the metric footed area of the surface area covered by the two tunnels runs about 7,000 square meters. So, you know, about akin to the size of a wing of the Louvre. Uh, so I want to uh, take advantage of this occasion really just to recognize some of the people who are not going to be up at the podium here. We have uh, the multimedia television film production company Filmwork, uh, represented by Luca Dal Bosco, who uh, have been centrally involved in coordinating this project, leading the project from the very outset. Uh, our collaborators uh, and uh, partners from the Museo Stori Fondazione Museo Storico del Trentino, uh, not only Beppe Ferrandi, Patrizia Marchesoni, who has worked closely on the project really from its inception. Elisabetta, of course, in Studio Terragni. Um, anybody else? Uh, well, we, the, the, the one missing, missing party here, which is uh, the uh, absolutely f uh, stupendous graphic arts studio in Bolzano that has been our close uh, collaborator from the beginning, uh, Gruppe Gut, uh, who are not, were not able to, to be present on this occasion, but uh, you will see their work uh, in a moment. Uh, one thing to add before we start is that uh, this is a project that uh, is beyond the size of the ego of an architect. So uh, every, so you need really to, you realize you, you can't be really with a big ego because it's too big. <laughs> and, uh, and basically there is, so we learn this, that uh, everything we try to do uh, in a larger scale, everything is incredibly expensive if you don't act in the right way. And the second thing is also you learn to be very flexible in the sense that uh, more the power of the images uh, started to grow in the project, 
the, and this is something I feel very comfortable, the design is starting to shrink a little bit or to move uh, in accord to this. So I think is for me the best uh, uh, result is also, first of all, that the client is still in the same room with us, so that is <laughs> pretty uh, unusual. <laughs> and, uh, and the fact that uh, basically we, uh, we really work as a team uh, trying never to step in the field of uh, the other. So that is unusual too. So I if think I could also add that the team in this case inclu has included, as you will see in some of the slides, uh, the entire carpentry division of the region of the Trentino Alto Adige, which is, uh, it has included the Alpine brigades who have been helicoptered in to hang banners across a cliff. Uh, it has included the highway authorities uh, who have been brought in to paint the actual signage that, uh, that uses the existing asphalt as a sort of surface. Uh, this is not just a large scale collaborative venture, it's a kind of military scale operation and uh, obviously, uh, as Beta says, uh, one very quickly uh, becomes aware that operating on this kind of scale is a profoundly different enterprise than being involved in, the, for instance, the design and construction of a small installation in an, in an art gallery. And that's been one of the tremendous rewards. And I think it's the source of a lot of the interest of the outcome as well, I would dare say. So what we're going to do here is the structure of this event uh, is, uh, as we've imagined it is, there will be, um, Beth and I are going to kind of take you on a kind of guided tour of the two editions of the Trento Tunnels project uh, known as Le Galerie. Um, uh, the 2008 edition and the current edition, which is essentially the permanent exhibition that's been designed for the, uh, the black tunnel, as you see. Uh, the design has used this structure in a kind of uh, distinctive way. I wanted to start, though, by showing you what the tunnels looked like when they were uh, relegated to their abandoned state, when, as uh, Beppe Ferrandi mentioned, the uh, access highway that enters the city of Trento was moved away from this, these tunnels that had been cut as a kind of scar running right through the central working class district of the city. Um, the, the, when these tunnels were built in the, in the early 70s, uh, this is what they looked like. They were abandoned around 2006. Uh, they lay dormant for two, three years. And the repurposing that you'll see uh, is the product of that, uh, that sort of current uh, phase in their development. Uh, so the, the highway was actually moved only about 300 yards away away from this site so that when you exit the, uh, as you'll see, the itinerary that we constructed in year one, which was 2008, you actually end up right at the edge of the current highway. So it's not as if the reality that surrounds this site is any different than the reality that they themselves belong to. Um, the disjunction is one that's been very much created by the, uh, the, the work in progress that is the, 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 their repurposing that's been taking place for the last two years. And um, just as you can see this uh, site, these site photographs here. There's one other point I want to make which uh, Beppe Ferrandi touched upon. This, the location of this uh, site is itself a very sensitive and significant site. One, as I mentioned, uh, it uh, is associated with this uh, act of urban renewal disruption that took place in the late 60s and early 70s. Second of all, the cliff that runs, that rises above this site is the site of the monument to the World War I martyr Cesare Battisti, a fascist era monument which is itself a kind of point of contestation over the identity of the region over, you know, a region that was split, as Professor Ferrandi mentioned, between the Austrian side in the war and the Italian side, uh, literally within single families. So, so this is a physical location that's very much marked in terms of the issue of the identity of the region uh, as a whole and uh, is highly visible from any location within the city of uh, Trento itself. Um, um, just, uh, these are just a couple of practical issues. There are two tunnels and they curve so that when you enter the tunnel, as you can see here, this is about halfway through, you actually can't see the exit. So they have a kind of interesting uh, physical structure that creates a sense of enclosure as you enter them and of exit only when you reach uh, at least a third to a half of, of, of the, uh, the distance into each of the tunnels. They're both curvilinear and they're parallel. Uh, in length roughly 305, 310 meters, uh, and they are enormous. You probably have never gone on a walk in a superhighway tunnel because that's not what, 
something one usually thinks of doing. But uh, these are tunnels that are of such a scale that it is more akin to the walking in the nave of a cathedral than it is to walking into a normally built structure. I think, as Beta can testify... It, yeah, but it's also yeah. that uh, you have the size of the cathedral but the smell of the highway. Yeah. So <laughs> something that we like very much. So it's also that we didn't want to miss this uh, feeling. So if you close your eyes, you, have, you can feel the sound, Wendy, of your voice. Uh, the light is becoming, even the artificial light is uh, changing uh, while you are walking. And, uh, and uh, yes, the, the, the smell of the asphalt is great. So we, we basically what we tried to do was how to keep the feeling of walking through the space uh, the first time. So it's, it's usually when you start the work, you want to change everything. We wanted this. We didn't want to do anything the first time we walked through. In fact, the, the main thing we've done is repave the, uh, the uh, asphalt, right? <laughs> so to renew the, uh, the smell, so to speak. <laughs> uh. So some of the, another important things is that the, of course, the uh, uh, tunnel had to be uh, painted with a special uh, uh, system to, uh, in a way, to uh, uh, prevent the pollution to uh, spread uh, around. So we had to decide very quickly so about the color. So we, they wanted to do this black or gray. So we had to decide very fast. So we basically out of the instinct, but we were working on the subject, as you will tell us. So we say, OK, one black and one white. So it was just to make troubles, but uh, this <laughs> turned out in a fantastic thing. So in one afternoon, they did the, w the job with an incredible machine. So it, it was also that we, we got the result uh, just quickly in the moment we asked for. No? The, um, the choice of black and white, I'll, I'll explain in a minute in terms of the first uh, sort of first phase of the development of the tunnels project. But I did want to mention one physical attribute which you didn't mention, which is these tunnels are actually slightly uh, inclined, which uh, for those of you who are physicists in the room, you'll know that that creates something called the Venturi effect, which means that because they run north-south, there are slight temperature discrepancies sometimes between the exit side, the northern side, which is mountain side, and the south, which is exposed towards the valleys to the south, which means that it's a wind machine that uh, will turn on every afternoon at a certain point, uh, which created some very interesting technical challenges as well. But we'll save those for a little bit later. Um, I just wanted to say, these are some of the themes that Professor Ferrandi already touched upon, but they were central to the, the, the inspiring sort of uh, principles to the experiment that was meant to be created in these tunnels. And the experiment was to create a kind of laboratory for what a history museum might look like uh, in a region that's rich with history museums, many of them very fine museums with really rich and fine collections, but as is the fate of history museums throughout the world, I would say that t it would be an understatement to say that they are underattended. Uh, they are largely neglected by audiences, in part because the models of historiographical exposition of presentation are models that rarely resonate with contemporary audiences. So one of the laboratory features of the space really involved in trying to reinvent the history museum as a genre in this very distinctive site, and to do so, as Pepe Ferrandi mentioned, with a focus on local history, regional history, but, w but from the bottom up. In other words, a narrative of regional history that is not that of the great political figures, uh, you know, Alcide de Gasperi, etc., the, 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 but rather uh, a kind of historiography from the bottom up, an emphasis on themes of material culture, of uh, different aspects of regional identity and so forth. So the, the themes that have been central to the various curatorial projects that have been undertaken thus far fit into this larger agenda of animating the archive. In other words, how, do you, how could we experiment with modalities for bringing archives to adding to the richness, the experiential richness of uh, being, coming close to these kinds of uh, cultural corpora, materials that are largely the province of specialists or even more often librarians, they're sitting in boxes gathering dust. Um, history from the bottom up. The World War I exhibition that we did never mentions uh, you know, a general. Uh, it's the story of how these events were lived by ordinary people, how their lives were shaped, or not even not shaped, by these events that um, had a powerful impact on the uh, region itself. Um, 
third, and Elisabetta already touched upon this, the, the issue of respecting, using the physical integrity and particularity of the site as an integral feature of what we could do. And as you'll see, we left the asphalt, the signage is all, rather than trying to transform the space into a conventional gallery, you might say, or exhibition space, we actually have tried the contrary, to keep it as if it were the experience of walking on a highway, uh, to keep the spatial and physical aspects of the building, even the roughness of the surfaces, the textures that come, the kind of geological almost quality of this concrete that's sitting under, uh, you know, a million tons of rock cliff above it. Uh, to heal a wound in the urban fabric of the, of the city by creating, experimenting with participatory models of uh, culture and particularly uh, uh, in integrating a participatory element into each of these uh, curatorial projects. And most perhaps most important for the success of the exhibitions that have been done this far, emphasizing really the, the, the powerful, both, both kind of experiential but, but, but also symbolic powers of walking in a tunnel. I mean, there's really something I think really uh, striking about going on a walk, a 300 meter walk, one way down through a dark tunnel and then returning in another. We've tried to play with that in the shows. They run north to south uh, to, to kind of create a march through time as a feature, an implicit feature of the way that the exhibitions are shaped to play with these ideas of excavating into the sort of guts, if you like, of the region, to play with the idea of the tunnel as a space of dreaming, of projection, of fantasy uh, as well. And you'll see how that uh, has a, a direct impact on what was done in 2008. Uh, so there have been two editions so far. And uh, do you, you want to add anything to that, Beta? Or, um, the, um, the first was, as, as Giuseppe Ferrandi mentioned, uh, a, a show dedicated to the theme of the First World War, a war which literally split the Trentino into, into two halves, and much of, uh, some significant episodes of which were literally also fought out on the landscape of the Trentino, particularly in the mountain uh, portions of the, uh, the most mountainous portions of the region. Um, and uh, this experiment was really an experiment uh, that had multiple ambitions. One of them was to see if one could reconcile a kind of experiential, even emotional model of using archival materials with a sort of more conventional scientific and didactic model. And the solution, as you'll see, involves the black and white tunnels. World War I is the first war whose historical memory is directly connected to the medium both of, mediums of both of photography, black and white photography, and of course of the documentary cinema, black and white, the black and white silent cinema. So we knew we had these extraordinary resources, not only the archive of popular writing, which is this extraordinarily extensive archive of ordinary people's memoirs and records about their experiences uh, during the war and, and, and after, but also the birth of the documentary cinema and its use as a, as a, uh, a way of capturing and narrating uh, the battlefront it was, as it was lived by ordinary soldiers. So the, the basic uh, strategy that was developed, the concept that was developed for this inaugural exhibition was to create two tunnels. One, a black tunnel, which was designed as a phantasmagoria, a kind of me a dead medium of the, you know, the 19th uh, century, namely a kind of gallery of ghosts where uh, through the use of projections and a series of theatrical effects using screens, uh, different kinds of, uh, of scrims, uh, we created a year-by-year year march through the years of the war with an acoustical soundscape based on readings from fragments of materials from the archive of popular writing accompanied by a series, a sequence of projections uh, that are historical projections organized year by year in clusters. Uh, and the white gallery was used instead, as you, you completed your round trip itinerary, as a march instead through the moments of the historical, the institutionalization of the memory of the war, step by step, from the immediate post-war to uh, the present, essentially, accompanied then by a series of, uh, of uh, installations documenting different aspects of the, po of the material culture of the war, from the way barbed wire transformed the landscape to uh, different aspects of the baggage that ordinary soldiers carried with them when they went to the front, uh, to a final section which was dedicated to a series of participatory spaces, including an oral historiography uh, project. The second edition, which we'll close with, is called Historically ABC, Historicamente ABC, 
And it's a different kind of experiment. It's an experiment with uh, trying to imagine um, how one could create a modular version of a permanent exhibition. It's an experiment with what the permanent exhibition might look like that will become the exhibition that fills gaps in the future programming of the tunnels. It's an exhibition that essentially uh, creates an alphabet where you walk down the entire length of the 300 meter tunnel through a series, an alphabet uh, from A to Z um, and each of those letters is connected to a theme that's central to the, the modern history of the region um, with a kind of sculptural two, three-dimensional ensemble that sets up, frames a series of film materials that are archival uh, in nature, uh, projected on the ground, so they're part of your sort of walking itinerary, and uh, with a return itinerary through a, an, a corridor that's, that's veiled from the main, the lead itinerary heading south to north, back from north to south, that takes you Gives you a, it gives a kind of human face of the map, of the topography of the region. And we'll say more about that with those when we get to them. So, Veta, do you want to jump in here on I the 2008 more, edition? I'm more comfortable okay. with yeah. the images. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is the, uh, the entrance, the, the, the main uh, entrance from the uh, south uh, side. We decided to avoid every sign outside except that we manipulate the sign on the asphalt to create the entrance of the exhibition so it was clear to everybody what was the uh, the main uh, the main entrance the first uh, edition we didn't close the space so it was like a being on the battlefield on, uh, in November probably and uh, the second edition we started to think about uh, more uh, uh, as a permanent structure so basically this was the impact and uh, uh, the everybody expected something inside so for, for us it was uh, uh, a great challenge uh, to avoid any structure any uh, anything that was uh, uh, even the sign was uh, uh, on this uh, plastic uh, uh, simple uh, structure so y there was really the expectation what's going on inside and you may notice that the symbol the logo of the Galleria is actually a highway it's borrowed from the standard European logo for tunnel uh, on uh, that you find on any uh, super highway uh, okay. um, this is the poster for the 2008 uh, edition and what you see here are the year by year. These are actually, the, as, as we've mentioned a couple of times, uh, all of the printed materials, all of the, uh, the projections that you see are rather technically crude. I mean, these were actually printed on like billboard paper and they're glued to the walls. I mean, the idea was to do something again that leaves the tunnel intact, that doesn't clean it up, that leaves cracks, that, that allows water to flow down onto the ground, that reminds you constantly of the fact that you're in this repurposed space, not in some kind of magically transformed, uh, transformed space. Uh, and the, um, the basic structure I, I very, in, I've, I've described it in a kind of initial fashion, it would take you from, this is from the south heading north, through the Phantasmagoria, which marches you year by year through the years of the war, until you exit the, the black tunnel and you come out in this little, little open space where the highway runs but right by here, so the, the sort of immediate past of the, of the galleries is <laughs> present. Um, in Italian, for those of you who aren't Italian speakers, uh, the word gallery and the word gallery, like in the sense of art gallery, and the word tunnel are the same words. So actually it's a kind of nice, rich pun that's a little bit harder to carry out in English. Uh, and then you, you would turn around, having completed your march through the years of the war, and enter the years of the com history of the memory of the war uh, through a series of uh, little structures which we'll show you in a second um, but before showing you those structures I wanted to show you some images of the construction process because I think you can only really feel the scale of the enterprise we're talking about here this was done in uh, literally I think three months of hard labor the entire 6,500 to 7,000 square uh, meters of the site were were rehabilitated from all the pollutants that it had accumulated over the course of 30 years of use uh, with an enormous team of, uh, of workers from different municipal authorities. But you can see this is one of our video technicians installing one of the 53 projectors that were used for the projections in the phantasmagoric tunnel, the, the black tunnel, right? Um, 
and uh, this is the white work going on uh, for the construction of the various podia that, uh, that accommodated the material hi history of the wartime uh, section, the central section of the white, uh, the white tunnel. Uh, so here we are in the Phantasmagoria as it was, uh, it was, it was built in the in, inaugura it was inaugurated in August, uh, August 19th of, uh, of 2008, uh, inaugurated by um, Simone Veil, the, uh, the president, former president of the European Parliament. Um, you see, basically, the, the idea was to take a, this medium of the Phantasmagoria, which is a sort of ghost show, if you like, and to use all archival materials assembled with historical rigor that would literally take you through this gallery of faces, gallery of memories, gallery of uh, historical documentary materials regarding different aspects, levels, strata of experience that made up the kind of rich humus of uh, World War I uh, in the region. And to leave the space intact, exactly as Beta said, uh, to leave it as intact as possible, even though we did project, as you can see, on um, all surfaces, uh, t from the, the, vault, the vault of the ceiling to the, to the ground, leaving the roughness, in fact, even emphasizing the roughness of the materials, sometimes distorting them rather dramatically. As you can see, a lot of the projections are deliberately distorted to create a kind of, uh, a kind of unsteady sense of the, uh, the, the, the uh, physicality of the space. Um, and with a lot of ghostly effects that alternate as you move through the space. There's a sound, uh, a soundtrack that's mounted and spatialized through a series of, of local speakers um, throughout the track that um, is accompanies, but it doesn't actually, isn't paired to the video images, with, the, with only one exception. Uh. These are just a couple of examples. You can see a lot of the projections which were mounted by the team at Filmwork actually take archival materials and massage them and manipulate them to create sequences of slides like, like sl uh, slide sort of fade outs, fade ins, uh, folds, uh, uh, layering sometimes. The entry of the, uh, the exhibition actually had this flood of letters coming down the, the curtain that were re rear projected on them and the exit had a flood of crosses from the cemeteries uh, that, that really completely reshaped the landscape of the Trentino in the wake of World War I as the sort of end experience. Um, so the idea was to do something that would be emotionally uh, potent, but that's entirely assembled out of historical materials. And, and one of the kind of, uh, I think, adventures here was to reverse the priority between digital supports and the physical experience. There's a, we built in Second Life an island which would allow you, after having experienced this immersive version of the archive of World War I, to go back and actually replay and see the actual archival records for what you had experienced. So if you wanted a second moment that was more conventional in terms of understanding what you had just experienced when you went through this uh, sort of immersive year-by-year uh, -year march through the years of the war, you could achieve that uh, from off-site. Uh, that was the idea, as well as on-site as a matter of fact. Um, this is how the years were marked uh, spatially through spotlights on these wall-mounted, essentially billboard paper uh, uh, um, uh, montages. And these panels uh, jut out into the walking space on the sidewalk, basically, of the tunnel. You can see we actually repainted the curb so that it would really feel like, a, continue to feel like such a space. Uh, and now this is the white tunnel. Do you want to say something about yeah, this? Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's also important to say that uh, this is almost the first generation in which uh, the grandfather or even older people are telling the story of the First World War to the kids. So the, the, the museum did an amazing work to record all this uh, testimony and uh, stories, but basically it's the first moment in which the, the, the connection, the link is, is broken. So for us it was also amazing to see uh, the two ge the different generations walking together in the tunnel and being involved into the explanation of uh, everything. We, what we did in the second tunnel, we played with objects with real objects that the museum have fantastic uh, uh, objects from the war. And uh, there are so many institutions that, uh, of course, they don't talk each other or they talk uh, in a strange way or they <laughs> hate each other or they love each other. So we created a series of uh, uh, structures very rough like barracks that remind uh, the barracks of the, of the war. 
uh, of the people that have been uh, uh, moved from their own place. But it's also that uh, for me it was crucial the, to have one step going into this uh, barracks, the sound of the, the wood, it was also uh, uh, amazing. And we uh, basically we create, uh, uh, some of the barracks have been uh, given to the little uh, or bigger museums that they did their own installation. So we were responsible only to help the museum to, uh, uh, to uh, install in this larger scale, but uh, basically they did the, the work by their own. One has been particularly interesting, this in which uh, uh, the data of the, uh, from the Alpine Museum, it was with this picture and at the same time with the hat hanging from uh, the, the ceiling, you have this kind of double uh, re register of uh, uh, image and also uh, the smell of the old felter was, was quite powerful. So in a way, the, and we cut some windows in each of these uh, um, uh, elements, but also into the little houses in the previous one eventually, we can, we can see this one. So in a way, everybody has his own space, but through the windows you are forced to communicate and to look each other. So, uh, and in, in a way we open up view that were not predictable on the paper, on the drawings, because every, if you move or shift to one or two degree, the story is different. So uh, we built this and we painted physically this by ourselves the last week, but this is another story. And, uh, and the, the graphic it was very um, um, flexible, so they uh, came and they started to glue and to cut the pieces of, of, the, of the graphic that uh, at the last minute. That in a way was also an attitude, trying not to be sleek and perfect, but trying to be adapt uh, to a kind of invented temporary uh, situation. So as you can see, the, 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 these houses, which are modeled, as Beta alluded to, after the, the, uh, the temporary housing that was developed in these so-called cities of wood that were the refugee camps of the World War I period, when one-third of the entire population of the Trentino region was, 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 uh, was uh, transported to these uh, concentration uh, zones, uh, are, they're deliberately play with the conventions of these uh, traditional, uh, these uh, temporary structures. Then we get into the middle section, which was this area of podia dedicated to different aspects of the material culture of the war from the, the, the random objects, not so random objects that soldiers or, or individuals would take with them when they were forced into these migrations to aspects of the rising industry of monuments, the production of monuments, which is going to completely transform the landscape, uh, not just of the Trentino, but of, mu of much of the theater of World War I. You can see these uh, support structures that, that Simone Vale visiting the, at the inauguration. Um, and uh, we're in the central zone once again here. And then the use of these materials, these extraordinary materials that document uh, the, uh, the, the way in which ordinary individuals uh, participated, in a sense, in the commemoration, in the, the, um, the collective drama of these mass displacements that um, accompanied uh, the war. At the end of the uh, itinerary, as I said, there are a series of participatory spaces. One of them was a digital lab where you could go back and revisit the tunnel the black tunnel, the phantasmagoria, looking at the actual archival documents, playing the clips, seeing where they came from, in a sense, re, uh, connecting to the actual uh, historical record uh, that you experienced instead as a kind of immersive environment. Uh, so we're going to conclude here with uh, a brief discussion of, this is our own Luca del Bosco here, riding in front of the uh, posters announcing the 2009 edition of the exhibition, Storicamente uh, ABC, historically ABC. Um, and uh, here the conceit was a different one, as I said. It was the idea of like a giant children's book except dedicated to the, the, the defining themes of the modern era in the Trentino. The idea was to create a model for what a permanent exhibition could be, but that would be flexible, where each of the letters could be changed over time, and where the final iteration of the project will only be, in a sense, achieved after many, many cycles uh, where this alphabet is developed to completely, in a sense, capture the, the, the central themes of, of the, uh, the era. So we have this alphabet that runs from autonomy. You can see each letter is composed of this series of panels that stick out at odd angles from the letter itself. It's a kind of sculptural ensemble. Each of them has a distinctive one. There, each is a montage of different elements developed in collaboration with our graphic artists, extending all the way to 
you know, V and, and Z, volunteerism in Zambana, the site of a disaster and then a, a major reconstruction project in the last uh, 30 years. And um, so we're just going to quickly show you how this works. There were a macro, each letter has a macro history and a micro history. The macro history is in a, a, a kind of montage of film materials, silent film materials, and uh, archival materials that cover the big theme, autonomy, the autonomy of the region. Uh, each panel, each set of pa each letter has two panels, uh, a, a synthetic chronology and a synthetic account of the argument. Then there's a micro history on two small screens, kind of private, very intimate screens uh, that accompany each letter as well. So what you get is, again, this experience of the depth as you walk through the, 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 uh, the, the, the 24, uh, 21 items that make up the alphabet with a small panel, a kind of veil separation that creates the much more intimate, smaller corridor for the reentry with projections on the ground marked by highway signage as usual, right? Uh, and the lights, the lighting system for these panels is an internal lighting system that actually very slowly shifts in color. So as you move through the tunnel, there's actually a phase shift that happens uh, that you're just vaguely aware of. It's on a very slow clock. And th this is what the kind of experience of walking down the tunnel looks like in this, in this, the current edition, which will be open through the end of this year. Um, at the center, there's a giant turbine suspended on a platform with a waterfall that evokes the, the central role that hydroelectric power has played in the reshaping of the landscape. With the sound installation, you see a couple of the letters here with their projections. And here's one of the micro histories, for instance, for the letter P um, that you see in, uh, towards the end of the dark tunnel. Mm -hmm. Do you, you want to say something? And it was also an incredible work uh, from, uh, the, from uh, the film work uh, with the acoustic because people really want to spend time there to listen to the interview, to uh, watch at the, at the thing. So it's also an incredible problem to combine the rhythm of your body walking through and uh, the rhythm of the uh, sound. You don't want to hear the sound uh, twice or things that are overlapping. So it's, uh, it's interesting that the entire technology is not uh, visible and is, uh, uh, people are just comfortable. They didn't complain, so it's, it's a positive. Usually there is, it's enough, a, a little overlap that uh, everything is uh, against uh, uh, the, the project. And I think uh, 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 this uh, uh, second uh, project was supposed to be like a, a transition, uh, an exhibition in transition for something else in the future, but we felt really comfortable to try to do something better than last year, more powerful, and not just to give up and to just to do something in between. Uh, the tunnel when you go back and uh, what I like is that uh, where there are these red lights this is a veil in, uh, in fabric that uh, uh, allow you to see through but you cannot go through and this is basically what I did uh, and it's wonderful because it disappeared into the space and the other things we create on the way back uh, that was the most difficult thing because people are used to walk and to get out uh, into the uh, landscape and uh, this time it was not possible so we create the return and uh, there is a bench that is, seems to be a simple bench but is a bench that is uh, uh, very strong and is 240 meter long that's it I made a sketch and these people they did it in one week so it was uh, it's also that they, we wanted with the engineer to uh, uh, refine the detail but it was too late it was done, it was built, it was there. So it's also uh, that some of the aspects that we created uh, with this uh, more permanent uh, element are there for, they will be there for a long time. Even if they will change uh, uh, the subject, they will change the exhibition. This is something that uh, is for the museum and is there. Uh, when uh, uh, Jeffrey uh, explained in such a poetic way the emptiness of the place is also that we need one of the tunnel empty for a security reason. So in a way we play the technical problem uh, in, uh, in, a, in a way that nobody is aware that uh, if there is something wrong uh, we can use the tunnel as a, a security uh, escape. <laughs> And um, the return corridor is, is kind of an interesting experiment and in its own right. The idea here was 
to take these grand uh, abstract themes, like kind of, you know, from autonomy to the role of the Dolomites, uh, uh, the role of, uh, you know, different features of the landscape, and to give them a human face. So the idea was to create this intimate corridor where you have a map of the region that goes from, uh, in this case, from north to south, because you, when you go outwards, you go south to north, and you come back north to south, to create a map that's literally a human map built out of testimonials. So what you see here are a series of monitors that have been mounted in a case that sits on the, this extremely long bench that Beta was just describing. Uh, where at every re at regular intervals are people who are speaking as if the human voice, if you like, of a location on this axis that runs north to south. But as you can see, accompanying them are these uh, various, uh, is a kind of trail of objects, of objects that, that in, in document different aspects of the life that give a kind of concrete materiality to the themes that are evoked on the other side of the veil, um, including this is Francesco Moser, the great cyclist's bicycle, his sprint bicycle, mounted on his, uh, this is a kind of tradition of, uh, of uh, cycling that some of you may be familiar with. This is a kind of trophy mount cut out of a trunk of a tree on which his bike was yeah. mounted. But the idea was we did not curate all of this space. We left it open so that it's a space for people to participate in the construction of a kind of historical record of the, the, the period. And there's some participatory aspects to the first year's edition as well. Um, so um, do you want to say something about the White Tunnel bit? Uh, yeah, the, yeah. For, the, this is the 2009-2010 yeah. edition of the The White great uh, uh, challenge of uh, the White Tunnel for this edition is it was that the museum have a very precise idea to create two, three more permanent uh, structure. And uh, the first one was a, a, a bookstore, um, and the second one was a, a space to gather uh, like uh, 50, 60 people together. But at the same time, they need also space for exhibition, and uh, we wanted to test the idea and not to do something permanent and heavy. So we create uh, a series of structure in wood in which uh, every uh, piece can be open and rotated in, in accord to the uh, use. Uh, the best, of course, that I wanted to keep it was the one that keep the tunnel completely open, so you can have uh, feel the perception of the space uh, along the length of the tunnel, but at the same time you can close it. Uh, we have had uh, many problems, structural problems, but uh, we come up with this idea that I really like uh, in also in terms of uh, uh, the way you touch the tunnel. So we create these uh, little uh, fingers that uh, gives, gives st stability without touching uh, uh, the ceiling and creating heavy structure, but in a way it's like a little uh, animal upside down that is trying to find his own way. And for us it was great because the structure was worked in a such a way that once the, the species went up, it was for gravity and they stopped in the moment they found their own uh, balance. So it was completely unpredictable, the, uh, uh, the result, but uh, in, in a way for force you or allow you to look up to the, to the ceiling and to see the ceiling that is the best part of, of the tunnel. So we try to use this, uh, this element. This was during the construction and there is a temporary exhibition and uh, uh, this structure with the bookstore and uh, this element can be, uh, this is a solution in which is completely open but then you can continue to move uh, uh, the panel uh, around. This was some of the uh, uh, during the montage of uh, everything. So now um, we're just going to conclude here before turning to the, the round table with just some talk about some of, the, some of the hypothetical plans that are under discussion right now for future development of this site. And the one that we're the most excited about uh, that we're going to just give you a kind of snippet of is, um, as I think maybe was implicit in the usage of the, of the curatorial usage that we've made in the two years project uh, of, the, uh, of the tunnels themselves, the idea of creating this site as a kind of allegory of a region that's shaped by the relation between its southern and its northern border. The northern border runs along the Swiss-Austrian line and the south faces Verona and, uh, and uh, the north-central Italy. 
uh, of creating, turning the space into a kind of allegory of that space, uh, of that larger uh, topographical setting, is one that got us interested in the idea of using the physicality of the site as a site for creating a series of didactic gardens. In other words, where the exit garden on the north would become a kind of teaching garden about the high dolomitic landscape and, and uh, flora, and the southern site would be instead a landscape built uh, without, by the way, and, and I think that becomes clear in some of the images you'll see, uh, without erasing the trace of the prior uh, usage of these tunnels. I mean, in other words, the garden would be entirely built in the asphalt itself with cutouts, with, in other words, use, reusings, uh, reusage of this site that uh, pr preserves the trace of its prior, of its prior memory. Uh, do you want to say something a little yeah, bit more this about it? Yeah. Just a few images of what we proposed because it turned out that the area out of the tunnel is, is quite large and uh, also there are some uh, uh, houses that really suffered uh, in the, from the 70s from the uh, traffic of the highway and there is a kind of uh, empty space between uh, the property and we occupy this with the idea uh, to make really clear that the asphalt was there before and uh, uh, there are these, all these stones that are uh, as if the, the, the asphalt is bent uh, and uh, the trees are coming uh, back again. And, uh, and uh, he, on the south side, the idea was to be provocative and to do more like a, 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 um, like a, a garden, like you call it in the south, the, um, uh, one is the Alpine and the, the Mediterranean garden. So it was more, and, and we did these montages, we, we, Alpha Gafkastein helped me to do this, because the, we just wanted to launch the idea and to say, eventually this could be a, a way to do only one part of this to, to show that this is possible and people in the summer can uh, use and experience this and to have uh, also the, the hill that is, have been so controversial for so many years that uh, maybe if uh, we allow people to climb up, uh, this could be a, another way to reconciliate the, the situation on the hill that is uh, 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 so difficult to approach. You, you have to imagine that the the image here, which would be this would be the Dolomitic uh, Garden, is yeah, you, built out of the construction debris from the tunnels themselves. Uh, is it has a super highway running right by it right here. So, so it's deliberately a kind of slightly pastiche sort of Dolomitic landscape that's been created right facing yeah. the the very reality that created the site of the tunnels themselves. So, um, and um, in closing, this is a, a kind of uh, a pitch. We're actually in the final, final round of the competition for Abitaris, <laughs> uh, uh, Italian oxygen competition, so we'd like your votes if uh, you happen to be so inclined. But uh, I just wanted to mention that in passing. We're going to now um, bring up the panelists who are going to... And the idea for this event, I just want to clarify, and maybe Marco and, uh, and Aaron and, uh, and Stani and Kurt, you could come up and sit up here while I'm just introducing this, was really to have a broad conversation about this issue of reuse, of the reuse use of abandoned portions of urban infrastructures. The High Line is not incidentally in the title for this event simply because we're in a moment where the whole issue of the kinds of opportunities for creative use and reuse of these sorts of uh, relics of the industrial recent and distant past, I think has really become a very important uh, transform transformative dimension of urban planning. And the Trento Tunnels Project is just one of uh, those kinds of projects that are ongoing. It has, like, like the High Line, its own distinctive set of historical constraints and opportunities that attach to it. So we thought it would really be uh, 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 important not just to present this project, but to, to raise the, you know, in a sense, to frame it within a, the broader conversation, which is really a conversation of our own time, a defining conversation conversation of our time around this large, I larger issue of, uh, of the reuse of, uh, of industrial sites. Court, do you want to, um, uh, Court was, is the only eyewitness participant in the inauguration of the Trento Tunnels that's, who's sitting on this panel since he was, uh, he, he even helped us out with the installation of a couple of sections of the, uh, the, the galleries in August of 2008. So I'm going to let you lead in on the conversation here. Um, and um, hand things over to you then. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, indeed, one of the aspects of this project which permits its comparison and connection 
There's so much else that it, it has been going on in the other parts is going on in the city and elsewhere is precisely the fact that a site of history is itself recovered. It isn't only an abandoned uh, piece of industrial um, in equipment or a site of previous uh, activity that falling fallow would now be occupied and put to some familiar museum uh, use. Uh, that is perhaps incidental to many of these operations, but prime, certainly not its, to the prime purpose. The prime purpose is rather, I think, to shift the ground and to let the sites of events become the sites of memory. Uh, that's why it was such a delicate act to try to bring together in this exhibition all of the existing features and introduce new ones so as to recover the locality, not so much as one of physical nature, but as one of memory. And I would just like to compare briefly uh, this uh, event in Trento with a couple of other ones that uh, have signaled such a change and such a different attitude to the conservation and presentation of historical objects. Of course, an old one is typically in the former area of huge industrial sites in the Rupert Valley, the Zechit Solferine, which is really not so much a museum uh, dedicated to former mining and uh, metallurgical uh, processes as a site of memory of the industrial age itself. And you use all the things of the industrial age provided to move about within it and to gain great height or to pass under and so forth. Then there is, of course, there are sites which are extremely painful and in fact remain an insult to the civilization of those sites. Let's say the submarine pens at Saint-Nazaire on the Atlantic coast of France, where uh, Gilles Clément, among others, have proposed interventions where the attempts of Allied bombing to create craters in these enormous um, cement fortifications for the submarines are now going to be filled with aspen trees that grow and in their nervous glittering of, uh, of a uh, copper oxide and silver above the sea and the sky, between the sea and the sky, will in a sense ignite these places and give to them a very distinctive immediate quality that everybody can experience and how you can recover those monstrous uh, constructions. Or, for instance, to be a little bit closer to home, the ballistic missile sites like Hombros in uh, northwestern Germany where instead of the huge silos, you can only see the covers, in this swampy territory there are now all sorts of pavilions and little mouse buildings installed that uh, uh, house uh, uh, artifacts. Then, of course, the landfill sites, which are monstrously large in many places, from the San Francisco Bay area to the lagoon of Venice, um, uh, various projects that have attempted to recover those sites, as it were, as a kind of collective nightmare of our own production, but now, as it were, accessible and open to uh, to uh, future possibilities. An age, the age of industry, of this massive transportation structure, the age of the Army Corps of Engineers and their equivalents in other countries have left behind these scars, wounds, m uh, either fantastically overdimensioned structures or helplessly inadequate infrastructures, and these can now be transformed into the sites of uh, memories. Uh, so it is really not just a simple change of destination or use, it is rather to recover within the debris uh, uh, of a, a civilization something that can become uh, a truly physically accessible, accessible to the mind, memory, the public, uh, and thereby uh, can be turned to a new use which is not just a substitution of the old use, but is in fact the acquisition of something new, the acquisition and the transformation of collective and individual memory. 
For these reasons, I think it was a something of a really stroke of luck that the idea came up in the nick of time, black and white. Uh, as it were, the day, the night, uh, the darkness of the tunnel, the light, and the ends. <coughs> the extraordinary difference between the art and so the gardens which I very much hope uh, can be realized in the future really complete this cycle whereby we do engage the natural uh, capacity of any place to transform itself by its own vegetation and thereby re-inscribe the traces, the fragments, the abandoned bits and pieces into the large topography of our daily and cultural experiences. <coughs> I have to admit from the very beginning that I'm incredibly partial to this project. I've already voted a few times in the entire <laughs> um, You know, what I'm most fascinated with in this project is what it recovers. And what it recovers is not just uh, this tunnel. Um, it's also a forgotten history of what an exhibition can be about. And when you look at Portuguese's 1980 uh, kind of legendary architecture exhibition in Venice and how he restored the Corderia uh, uh, for, uh, you know, for the purpose of display, when you look at uh, uh, Gregotti's uh, earlier exhibition in Venice and the way that he too had kind of sought to make the project not just be about architectural display but about the kind of recovery of an infrastructure, of an urban infrastructure that had fallen into disuse, um, you kind of realize that what this project does is kind of remind us of what exhibitions used to be about and what they are not often about today. Again, they're not always just about display. Um, sometimes they can take a more experimental route, one that has social ramifications, again, repurposing ramifications. But what, what also, uh, you know, um, uh, what, what it also reminds us of um, this notion, I think, that, um, that, that kind of courses through Jeffrey's rhetoric and grammar, that an exhibition is an experiment. And we often think of an exhibition as something that has to enact X or Y or Z, but I think what Jeffrey's done is really think of it, as he says always, uh, as a laboratory. Um, and the impermanent nature of these exhibitions, the way that they're changing, um, but also the way that he's experimenting with how to animate an archive, uh, with how to re-engage re a public, which is so disillusioned today with the notion of the exhibition. Um, but, uh, but which is also experimenting with the idea of participation and social engagement. I think that's something that you see here so much. And so to those that would, I mean, a, you know, a curator often uh, is the first to tell you that an exhibition can only do so much, but I think what um, the team here is doing is kind of reminding us that an exhibition, again, is a thought experiment. Um, it's not something that has to literally enact what, it, what it's about. It's something that can play out more symbolically. Um, and there's a way, I mean, when I was looking at these images that they were presenting, um, there's this wonderful performativity to the project. It discloses the complexities of the site. Uh, you know, they, they don't just try to cover over the fact that this is an enormous undertaking. They also disclose the logistical challenges, the nightmares, the handicaps. Um, and I think that's something that gets lost today. Often um, a curator has to go to great lengths to find <coughs> the logistical challenges that make an exhibition possible. And increasingly those logistical challenges don't just precede the project, they determine what form it takes. Uh, they are financial, they are architectural, they come in so many forms and there's something beautiful about the way that you try to disclose those, those complicity, those entanglements, um, because they very much determine the exhibit, they don't just, and, you know, proceed, uh, proceed it. Uh, so I suppose those are, those are the, the, kind of my initial comments, and I'm eager to hear how the panel puts out. Thanks. Look, I think, yes, I am the only Italian uh, <laughs> <laughs> So let me first say that it's uh, a true great pleasure to be in here in New York speaking about Italy, about a serious, brilliant, intelligent project instead uh, of reading about uh, the private and criminal story of our Prime Minister. I say, and the first time I feel normal at any time. Great. Thank you so much for the uh, 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 There are two more actors that I think we can, we can discuss the, today. Um, one is uh, the very peculiar uh, way for interpreting preservation in front of this project. Normally we speak about preservation when we are in front, confronted with, uh, <coughs> with uh, the Corderie 
then it's arsenal, but even the Solferai, the decade Solferai, it is a true monument of industrial architecture. It still are two tunnels. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing more than uh, two tunnels, but uh, I think it's very important to observe uh, they were empty tunnels. They were something that uh, was becoming invisible. Uh, no more disturbing probably the population all around because that was not the more crossing uh, the river in Trento. But uh, the tunnels were there on one side and the other side were becoming useless. So in people. I think that is a very crucial uh, sense uh, for every uh, presentation. That means making again visible tunnels, bringing again to life uh, uh, tunnels. I remember my I, my master, Raffaele Tafuri, was uh, uh, always saying, uh, apropos Venice <coughs> uh, that it did not make any sense to discuss too much about what to do in Assen. The first thing was to open the door and <laughs> allow people to enter and to transform <coughs> a miss, uh, something missing in a very I think that it's very brilliant that in Trento, a lost tunnel became an, again an urban presence. The second uh, aspect that I would like to underscore, and it's even more interesting for me, is the quite peculiar interpretation of, uh, of the site, of the site specific. Because, uh, for example, from I read the, in the introduction of in Habitare, uh, um, a suggested similarity between High Line uh, in New York and uh, Tunnel in Trento. <coughs> I do agree, but I only partially agree. Because what is the High Line here? It's beautiful, I like it. It's one of the most beautiful projects by Villa and So, uh, but uh, finally, it allowed as uh, a, an experience that is essentially very similar to the original one is reopening, uh, um, what can you do that? You can walk. <laughs> uh, you can walk uh, perceiving the uh, urban landscape from a different uh, point of view. From, uh, and, and so it's very, very interesting, but there is uh, an, an essential coherence, finally, between uh, the interpretation of the site highline uh, and its history, its origin, and in this case, we could speak about a displacement of the place, if the pun is, uh, can be allowed. Uh, because you enter in a tunnel, you find, you find a museum. Uh, you, you, uh, you are in a tunnel, you are conscious in a tunnel, but I think the architect's better was great, maintaining the asphalt, <laughs> not hiding the original structure. So you are consciously inside of a tunnel. You are walking through uh, from one entrance to, to an exit. That is a peculiar for being in, uh, um, uh, in a tunnel. But uh, the experience you are experiencing inside uh, uh, of the tunnel is, is, is uh, very different. Uh, one more fun, uh, uh, the tunnel is becoming a gallery. Uh, in Italian it's a gallery. <laughs> um, and, uh, I think that is um, uh, a very important um, element. I think that preservation should be able to establish this tension, this polarity about the original condition of, let's say, the monument and uh, the, uh, the, new, uh, the new proposal, the new use, the new experience inside of uh, uh, it, because that means production of new meaning, not only preservation of meaning, not only um, actualization of original meaning, but really extension of meaning, production of meaning. And what we need, I think, in our urban place is production of meaning. Experiences which allow us to interpret in a different way the context where we live, the history in which we live, uh, and so on. Last uh, time, let me say, <laughs> is it the prototype uh, of the tunnel 
built for the gallery of the Maxi by Dad in the room. Thank you very much for including me in this. Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, I don't have a value story to take out of my pocket. But I am extremely grateful that I've been referred to as uh, somebody uh, living in Zurich, uh, Switzerland, which puts, me, uh, which puts me in the position of somebody who can simply try to react in a neighborly fashion, uh, located in a not too uh, distant country, an alpine country, that is confronted with a similar heritage of industrial ruins and industrial uh, vestigial elements of, of a landscape that have to do with an extremely rapid uh, industrialization uh, uh, in the last uh, 150 or 180 years and that offers uh, uh, possibilities of which we do not know anything uh, and uh, in, in this context I think this experience of the trend of has been extremely uh, that are going to be uh, extremely uh, helpful and extremely interesting. I uh, have not knowing uh, the troubles, not having been there, but of course it's the first thing that I'm going to do whenever I send food to Europe again, um, I have prepared a number of uh, images that simply echo uh, a similar uh, uh, situations in my country, but I do not want to show them. This is, of course, not my country that is friend of, and I do not want to show them because I have seen uh, extremely interesting and much more beautiful uh, images. I would like to uh, simply, uh, in addition to the reverberations with which we have been confronted on the beauty and the importance of the relevance of the project, I would like to address uh, a certain uh, number of perhaps a little bit more specific issues that uh, simply have to do with my uh, admittedly Swiss curiosity as to the mechanics of the coming about of this entire project. Of course, uh, first of all, I feel uh, the need to congratulate both the client, the curator, and the architect for this extraordinary uh, achievement, for this extraordinarily uh, challenging laboratory of how exhibitions maybe in the future could be made. At the same time, of course, I am enormously surprised and enormously fascinated um, by the fact that um, there has been one client, one curator, one architect, mm -hmm. and the people. Um, I'm uh, living in a country where uh, discussions about uh, history, uh, about historical museums, involve dozens of commissions, <laughs> dozens of commissions. Uh, in these commissions there are historians. If the, com if the museum or the installation in play, uh, on the question happens to be in a major city, this all being of course very, very relative, a major small city like Princeton like Zurich where there are something like 18 academic historians uh, teaching at the, at the local university, which means that the committee will have to be uh, at least 36 historians, uh, each professor will have a number of non-academic uh, um, um, specialists to his side. And um, the, the, these discussions tend to be extremely interesting, I imagine. I, I've never seen one. Uh, and then at one point, um, um, before the deadline is, is, is coming closer, uh, somebody, probably the director of the institution, will have to hire a designer. And the designer has generally no idea about what, 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 what the historians have been discussing. There is the, 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 the historian has no idea about what the, what the designer is trying to propose. And at the end, we have uh, the typical collage of a history museum where we have splendid ideas, a huddle model of splendid historical visions of the past and ways of putting them into interesting uh, concepts and a design which is superimposed on this material and which uh, adds, um, and at least, uh, uh, I'm talking, of course, the Swiss National Museum, it will be able to verify it's very close to the Zurich uh, uh, station, if you see it, uh, which adds to a general theme of confusion, which uh, seems not to be the case in this particular situation. And this seems to have something to do with the fact that there was this relatively simple uh, setup of one 
curator, one architect, one client. And I actually would like to have some verification on that. Um, uh, absolutely beautiful images that, uh, in a certain sense, view from, uh, from my sort of Helvetic uh, uh, um, uh, viewpoint um, suggest uh, the presence and the activity of at least uh, a little brigade of artists and filmers, filmmakers, etc. that have been involved, but this seems not to have been the case. Or maybe it has been the case, but I'm extremely curious to know um, uh, more about it, about the, 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 the way this uh, incredibly productive situation has been engineered and what the, what the political uh, framework and background for this to happen um, has been. History from the bottom up, um, that is obviously the, the thing to do. I also must say from my Helvetic uh, kind of point of view, uh, I, I have been confronted, this is a strange situation for the country that has uh, been uh, observing the war, uh, but at the same time in some economic and other ways, psychological uh, ways, of course, involved in the, in, in the war, in the war, and that is now cultivating a sort of an, a culture of introspection um, at, um, with TV stations, uh, organizing movies that reconstruct the life uh, in the bunkers of the soldiers and so on, every day, wife, you know, that, that is also the kind of the, the, the culture of bottom up, which to a certain point, of course, has raised certain issues as to whether uh, uh, the, the, the bottom uh, uh, may not be uh, the, the pit where, 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 where much uh, of uh, the, the questions that involved the past uh, 150 years of history may somewhere be uh, sort of uh, get also get lost. So uh, I wonder if the, 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 methodolo the methodology of the approach has uh, uh, raised questions, maybe also has uh, suggested discussions that um, um, uh, placed here and there, maybe uh, a question mark. Um, I find this idea that Marco has just uh, uh, formulated of uh, giving significance <coughs> to the landscape by simply showing, displaying also uh, its infrastructure, the enormous quantity of uh, artificial space that industri industrialism has left behind. Um, I think this is an, an extraordinary challenge, an extraordinary challenge for regional exhibitions, for national exhibitions in the future. I imagine, I, mean, I don't know why actually, uh, 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 future uh, world fairs are continuing uh, to um, uh, put an enormous, I don't know why, it's very interesting to go that direction, uh, into, into the building of ever new infrastructure uh, to support it. Whereas uh, there is an, an, a, there is an entire continent of uh, artificial landscape that waits to be filled, to be <coughs> re-semanticized somehow uh, with the help of exhibitions like this one. So I just want to congratulate everybody so far. I wanted to say something about what uh, you
Why? Maybe I'll, I'll say a couple of things. I mean, uh, Beppe would be the ideal person to respond, uh, particularly to the behind-the-scenes political uh, machinations that were required for this project. But what I will say is, the um, um, as I think Beppe said very ex very eloquently, um, this was an extraordinarily complex project. And so the fact that the t the, the core kind of concepts and the kind of core operating group was small. Uh, basically, at Filmwork, there are uh, maybe a half dozen people who were working on the, the, basically mounting the multimedia materials and administering the whole project. Uh, I had my lab uh, working on some parts of it. Beta had a couple of people. So, and Grupa Gut was basically three people, maybe four people, four graphic <laughs> artists. Uh, so it's still a pretty small group. I mean, you know, by your standard of a committee, on the museum side, in 2008 we had the chief curators, directors of about five of the history museums in, as part of a kind of alliance that, uh, for the production of content for the houses, working with some autonomy, but with, with myself sort of as a coordinator, with Beppe as a coordinator, um, the, it was a very fluid kind of organizational structure which obviously violates certain bureaucratic norms and uh, standards of consultation. Uh, I, you know, there's a lot of skepticism in the community of, of local historians precisely about the methodology both the bottom-up methodology, but especially this kind of what they view as a uh, uh, highly speculative experimental model for uh, working with archives as if they were media materials, you know. Um, but the interesting thing was uh, when we planned the inauguration of the, the uh, 2008 of the uh, tunnels for the general audience, uh, we planned to have an audience of maybe 500 people there. 2,500 people arrived. Uh, and the total, the, the exhibition was extended twice in duration. The total spectator numbers were around, I think, 30,000 um, for, uh, you know, for a history exhibition, essentially. Uh, um, so, you know, people voted with their feet. Uh, and the resistance in the local kind of historical community, which is very conservative, I think uh, was silenced by that, you know. So there were some special circumstances that allowed for this to happen, uh, but uh, the uh, I think um, uh, it is a model that has at least some transferable features. I, I don't know, Beta, if you want to say and something also more. Also, there is yeah. uh, this aspect that uh, is a region that is very well uh, a province that is very well organized in terms of uh, the labor and the people, and at the same time there is a sense of what is uh, belongs to the community. I was uh, struck that uh, the first uh, edition we installed everything in one month and uh, people really worked uh, with uh, the feeling that this was something that belongs to community and uh, uh, mention, to, to mention what you said before for an Italian it was something as if he, 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 you wonder if it was uh, the same uh, uh, country and it's not about uh, the financial support uh, it's about the fact that uh, uh, really people uh, in, uh, that are, belongs to the, uh, the, the province, people that have uh, a normal job, into the, they really wanted with this incredible precision to realize what was, uh, uh, we asked to them. And the second uh, thing is also that uh, I think it's is true that the small group is working very well, but it's also that uh, to have a, a client with a clear idea uh, and uh, a curator that is never change his mind. I think is, this is also the, the key point. Uh, and also allow to the architect to try things that uh, maybe you never tried before, but with the feeling that the historical frame and the approach is really serious. You are not here just to uh, put together images to make fun. And, uh, and, and this, for me, was, uh, it was crucial. I have had uh, experience before and after of different kind with uh, uh, even uh, more organized people, but uh, it was a failure in the sense that uh, if the curator is not uh, 
taking uh, responsibility for what is doing uh, it's uh, and also it's uh, such a huge uh, um, uh, uh, dimension that we you need to learn to trust people i trusted people from the museum i trusted jeff i, I didn't uh, check anything and everybody did his own work and jeffrey discovered the size and the shape of the little barracks only the day of the opening and i knew about the text uh, only because there was no literary time to uh, to be worried or to be envy or to fight there was no time so uh, and only in this uh, condition you uh, had the pleasure to work because uh, uh, we waste so much time in this stressful situation that uh, here he, he went fast because uh, uh, the museum uh, when the director told us no you can't do this uh, this is not the time for this it was clear it was a clear no it was not just a changing of mind and not to mention what uh, they did in the archive uh, uh, Jeff Jeffrey and I, we have had a kind of the maximum pleasure for an historian. We went in the basement of each museum to collect things like, a, like in a dream, you know, to everything we ask. We want a bomb, we want a canoe, we want, and they gave us everything. So also to transport and to move and to these things, he was uh, in, in Milan or in another city, you need uh, just for the permission, it takes two, uh, two years to, to get there. No? So it's also, that was a kind of a, also this uh, shifting in time, everything was so fast in the, in the way, I mean the turbine that it was just a little picture, I mean they took the, uh, uh, the transportation was uh, in itself something to document uh, only to move something uh, into the, the place. Um, well, the, the uh, really the scale and the complexity of an enterprise like this has made it very much a kind of uh, disp uh, despite what might seem like the final pro uh, the, the various final iterations as being rather fully codified at least interpretations of the space uh, very much a step by step process. So um, I think that there is uh, the original idea for this project, uh, as uh, Beppe Ferrandi mentioned, came from the president of the region, uh, uh, Lorenzo de Lai. Uh, if his political fate uh, continues to be uh, ascensional, um, this is a project that will have strong political support. Uh, it's been a successful project, I think, by all measurements. Um, but it's very much a step-by-step -step process. I mean, I think the long-term intentions are maybe within a time frame of uh, three to five years are to create a permanent laboratory space in these galleries. So this is a prototyping phase, uh, if you like. 
the permanent exhibition with its modular structure is a kind of permanent exhibition, uh, but uh, it's not an irreversible course. It's not a, a you know a train that cannot be stopped, uh, and the the group that's been of uh, the the coalition of partners that have been the core partners, the Fondazione Museo, Filmwork, Studio Terragni, myself, uh, Gruppe Gut, uh, we're all uh, you know, quite eager and happy to continue working on the project, but it, it's, it's contingent like all such large public, public projects that really depend on the support of, of you know, a whole set of regional authorities. So I'm afraid that's a little bit of a, <laughs> a, a, a tentative answer, but that's, that is the, uh, that's the reality of this situation. Uh, but I, I did want to add just one point, which uh, Beta touched upon, the, um, because it comes back to this question about process. And uh, this uh, curating uh, 7,000 square meters is not like curating a, a regular exhibition. It, you're, it's, there are moments that, where you feel like Napoleon, and there are moments where you feel like you're there with the paintbrush in the, in the uh, you know, painting the little you know uh, uh, the the wood shacks that we built, um, and a lot of the creative input, uh, I think, as Beta was suggesting, came from the workforce. We had a tremendous, uh, tremendously rewarding experience of many of the the brigade of people from the various construction forces within the region actually being actively engaged to the point where, in the 2009, the current edition, what's up right now, there are objects that were brought in on trucks by workers uh, who just thought that they had a contribution to make too. So this idea of like a kind of a, a, a patrimony that is owned, but that the bottom-up story has as a feature this, this, this rich sort of uh, participatory potential that was started not at the level, of, uh, not the level of our theoretical intentionality, but actually at the lever, level of the actual working force itself getting engaged in the content production side, not just in the, you know, operational, you know, we build the, you know, we we, we build the display cases now. Tell us what to put in. Um, that has it's related to a distinctive set of circumstances, obviously. But I think they, I, my, I personally believe that they're replicable in in other contexts as well. Um, I mean, I've I've had some sort of convergent experiences, at least maybe not on this scale. I don't know. Uh, there is also, in the end, a very valuable pedagogical dimension to this. That is to say, you have to try to find. Uh, an approach to whatever the site may be uh, that uh, you will want to transform in a meaningful way. That requires that you do more than uh, impose upon it one or another of the familiar strategies. So, I mean, uh, Beta is now teaching courses at the City College with the students where they are surveying and assessing the 1964 World's Fair site in uh, Flushing. Uh, mm -hmm. Meadows, uh, kind of uh, abandoned totally to seemingly uh, a pure mechanical and physical decay. And the question ar arises can one make something out of it without just simply restoring it, which would be meaningless, simply imposing something else because the space is available, which would be an arbitrary <coughs> and beautiful, uh, uh, or just letting it rot, so to speak, right? So this is an interesting challenge. Should New York make something of its own former sites where it tried to, in a sense, reflect on itself and present itself? You just touched the point that you were saying that we create memories. And all of you are talking about memories of people. We are we enter in 21st century in which we realize the cultural nature of intertwined. Yes. So that by creating a memory only of what people did, you forgot that like this tunnel is an example of natural destruction where you cut with your hand, it doesn't go again, it cut. So something about the nature the, and what the interaction which is not cultural. It's actually physical manifestation of the way we live on the land has to come there too. Yeah. And a lot of people don't understand that, we, that our civilization of 10,000 years is about that small, but what comes underneath yeah, yeah. is like a whole lot there. So 
it's important that we begin to see the interaction between na nature and culture. It's important that we understand what we do to nature and what we have done to nature, or is there a way in which we can mitigate? Because the way all the examples that you were giving, all of them are saying nature will take care of itself. No, it doesn't. When you cut your finger, it's gone. So it's important to to understand that there is a shift also in the way we think that it's not man is the center of all things anymore. And memories are based on a whole lot of other living things and non-living things. And I think that I, I didn't see that. So the montage will not be like the garden, I can assure you. But what I'm trying to say is that it's important to extend the memories into the landscape and not just end up at the, at the entrance and exit because it wasn't just that. It was all the things that happened. If others have questions and want to jump in on the conversation here, we have a reception awaiting us down on the first floor in a few minutes, but I mean, there's a little bit more time for conversation, so um, please. please. Um, I haven't seen this, and I've never walked or motorcycle. <laughs> I've been in those fast trains in Italy that go through, and then there's a kind of shock uh, when the sound changes and everything that you were, your senses were in touch with is cut off when you don't go into these tunnels. And um, there's also the, the question of light, which you didn't talk about too much because you're having to deal only with artificial light. You have no windows, you have no mirrors, I can see any. And um, so there's a, a question of this kind of emotional reaction that people have when they're in something that's dark and claustrophobic. And I wonder if you, how you dealt with the emotional part of what happens to people in relation to their looking at artifacts in this situation. It, ha it happens that I just came back from Atlanta and I went to two history museums there and everything is very interesting. You can have lots of fascinating artifacts, but there's this detachment in, in most history museums that I've been to where you can't really interact with the, even the, the videos you have the sense of distance, but if you're in a tunnel, it seems to me you can't get away from them. Um, <laughs> so how, how does your exhibition technique deal with that emotional I, I don't know if you, there, it was really, uh, it's, a, it's quite an interesting question because the, um, we, you know, we, when we first uh, were working on the 2008 edition, we had no idea how effective it would be. Obviously, the analogy between trench, the experience of trench warfare, the role that tunnels themselves played in the World War I experience sort of made it the phantasmagoria part of things. I think we thought it was a rich sort of, you know, uh, vein to explore. But uh, people were absolutely, uh, it, much as you were suggesting, the sensory deprivation of the experience of moving into a tunnel space combined with the uh, kind of everydayness of the archival materials were extremely well and people were very moved uh, in part because a lot there's a lot of a of, of, of significant slice of the visitor audience that had a personal memories mm -hmm. to the point where we actually had repeatedly workers and the project uh, recognizing family members in the documents uh, in ways that were completely unpredicted. So, I mean, it, it, there was a kind of this, this uh, sense of connection to the materials that intensified that experience when people went through the, both the phantasmagoria side of the itinerary and the return itinerary in the white gallery as well. I don't know if you, were you thinking well, of that as well? I to add that from the beginning we avoided uh, at all to have these sounds like the war, create this bombastic effect. So the fact that the tunnel, the tunnel was silent, people were walking like a line, and also the voice of people, it was not just the voice of uh, somebody with a good, beautiful voice, uh, like from the television, but it was from the interview. So there were people that uh, uh, they, the museum recorded these voices in the last uh, 25 years. So there were memories and uh, story about the war. 
So in a way, it was uh, uh, like to be in a huge experience, but to be, have a kind of private relation between you and the person that was talking to you. So, uh, and uh, he, he, the images play the role of the power of the war with all these people walking on the snow, with these endless uh, uh, and pointless uh, things to, to push for days the same uh, machinery up on the, on, on the uh, uh, mountain, then to be killed, and that's it. So, uh, and I think it's, it's also that the silence was played an incredible role in, the, uh, in this uh, uh, story of the memory, because uh, people were really like uh, a great respect of the, of the place. They felt comfortable, and uh, we created a series of possibilities to uh, get out and to connect to the other tunnel, but nobody did it. Uh, because uh, it was simply an experience uh, 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 that was uh, uh, in balance with uh, the movement and the rhythm of the, the space. We were very careful not to leave uh, too many spaces between images because people can feel, feel the, uh, fi the connection with memories can be uh, too weak, but at the same time not to also to uh, add too much. And I, uh, even we, c we have also the possibility for older people to, uh, we play the, the, the idea to uh, uh, have a little car, electric car to help them. And after the first session, what are you talking about? <laughs> they start in party. So they, they wanted to uh, cross the entire space and to have uh, uh, everything, including the most difficult part, like uh, the images of the concentration camp. And, uh, and, this, and they went through with the kids, with the people, and uh, the numbers for a place like this, 20,000 uh, uh, people uh, uh, going to see the exhibition, and many people went back over and over again to uh, explain, to bring other uh, uh, people from the family. So, in a way, uh, what uh, I really like of this experiment, that uh, the museum say the first edition is an experiment. If it doesn't work, that's it. We, we, we give up and we do something else. So it was also uh, through the mistakes uh, or through the experience of the first one that we uh, started to work on the second one because people now, they feel the space uh, that belongs to the community. If I could just mention the sound, we didn't talk a lot about the sound installation, but as Veta mentioned, um, we didn't have actors reading excerpts that were anthologized from the archive of popular memory. We actually went to a senior home so we had voices of people who actually came to visit the exhibition to hear their readings of fragments, uh, that the fragments uh, from memoirs and cards and letters that made up the sound itinerary. So again, I mean, the, the idea of the production of content, a kind of distributed model for how you produce the content that then gets, you know, choreographed, assembled, shaped into an immersive experience. I mean, that I think it's a much more fluid structure than a traditional, very tightly top-down, controlling kind of of museum-based model of what curatorial practice is. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a professional curator. I'm a, I'm a cultural historian. But I think the design of that experience as a more fluid process is actually why it was successful in these, these, these first iterations that we've been able to put together. Are there any other, um, any, 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 any other comments? Or, uh, yes, in the back there? If you could speak loud so everybody can hear you up here. Well, I think the core one is the one that we, I think we, we mentioned in, in describing the core concept of the black and the white tunnel, which was the idea that the black tunnel is a, is a kind of experiential space. Uh, I mean, museums uh, and, and sp museum-like spaces are spaces that are largely been d defined by a certain, a certain kind of 19th century style of scientific exposition with certain sorts of rules about the, the senses that are meant to be primary, activated, and so forth. So the, the, the Black Tunnel, the reason I thought, I, I was interested in the Phantasmagoria as a model, not only because I love Phantasmagorias and ma magic lantern shows, but I also thought that they, there's a kind of richness to those sorts of poor media that are part of the prehistory of the cinema that were sort of appropriate to the specificity of the tunnel as a place of sensory deprivation. Uh, 
And so what we tried to do really was to, to as Beta said, for a, series of a whole series of design reasons, to really play on those kind of elemental features of an immersive experience where in the absence of, uh, you know, where, where this kind of sensory deprivation on the level of, let's say, maybe light has as its counterpart a kind of richness in terms of smells, in terms of the kind of weird, almost grotesque tactility of a tunnel space with cracks, with, you know, irregularities, with, uh, and to try to use that in relation to the material, uh, to get the material to play off of that. The fact that archival materials are messy, they're dirty, they're faded, they're fragmentary. Um, but but one very important aspect of the experience, and I, I have the privilege of being able to speak with some uh, 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 repeated uh, exposure was that the black tunnel basically felt as if you were indeed um, uh, entering a kind of spectral zone. You got lost in this darkness of the past uh, where all the things, despite their uh, real appearance in uh, film clips, in photographs, in sound, were all enormously distant and irrecoverable. They, were, they belonged to a gone, bygone world. But then, and that was the great thing, you go back and you pass through the same situation, through the same moments, and there, exposed on white ground, and presented like the last object surviving from this period. You could see the actual little photographs poorly glued into an album. You could see the actual photographic equipment. You could see the various uh, pieces of, uh, uh, of uh, equipment that had survived and so forth. So you saw, in a sense, the same time twice. Uh, you saw it once by getting lost in it, and you were really sort of relieved by getting out of it. And then you saw it again, but totally reduced to a material evidence, as if you were inspecting the site of events that were also distant from you, but in a very different way. Mm -hmm. And if yeah. it hadn't been, this kind of two-way street, I think neither half would have had the incredible emotional power that it, uh, mm -hmm. that, that it had. Without any contrivance, by the way, this was not making a lot of pedal on people's experiences. It, it, it was by letting the things literally uh, have their effect on you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also, I think psychologically, the, the word you listen walking through the tunnels are a very well-known word from your uh, uh, grandfather or from a story or from uh, what you learn in school. It's an experience that is part of uh, uh, the history of our country so mm -hmm. or in general the history of uh, uh, Europe. So it's not something that you listen to the story or what is this about. I mean, it's, a, it's a people that talk about uh, uh, the deprivation of things or the joy of a certain aspect. It's, it's not the the story are not only about uh, uh, negative things, it's also the capacity to go through uh, an experience like this. So I think it's also, uh, this is a play mm -hmm. a good role in the, in the exhibition. I, I think we should uh, continue this conversation downstairs at the reception, so thank you all for, uh, for coming. And, uh, thank you panelists uh, for joining us uh, here. <laughs>